Okay, I think we're live. So uh, hello, I'd like to welcome everyone for joining us today for today's Ask a Radiation Oncologist session focusing on lung cancer. I'm Malcolm Mattis and I'll be moderating this session as a representative of the Astro Communications Committee. I'd like to start out by thanking the Astro staff, particularly Jeff White, Daniel Mulligan, and Beth Bucata for helping to facilitate this event. We have a distinguished panel of speakers who volunteered to share their expertise in lung cancer with us today. This includes Kristen Higgins from the Emory University Winship Cancer Institute in Atlanta, Salma Jabor from the Rutgers University Cancer Institute of New Jersey, Cliff Robinson from the Washington University Seidman Cancer Center in St. Louis, and Jim Urbanek from the UC San Diego Moores Cancer Center. Thanks to each of you for being with us today and for all of the work you've done as leaders in clinical research and patient care that's improved the lives of many patients with lung cancer across the country. Next slide. So the format for today's session is uh, first, we have some prepared questions that we'll be asking our panelists. Um, we'll also be taking questions uh, via uh, the Facebook chat from anyone watching. Um, this recording will be available online after the session if you missed anything. Next slide. Uh, there will be a lot we don't have a chance to cover, of course. Lung cancer is a big topic. Um, I would definitely recommend that anyone listening go to RT Answers. Uh, our, uh, the Astro community has some brochures in English and Spanish that are good for patients, also side effect charts. Uh, next slide. Uh, there's also some excellent videos about radiation therapy in general and radiation specifically for lung cancer. Next slide. And finally, uh, you know, there's lots of information, not just about lung cancer, but about a variety of a whole host of malignancies, and you can search for them using this tool here on rtanswers.com. So next slide. So uh, we're going to start out today by just going through some of the basics of diagnosis of lung cancer. Uh, and the first question is for Dr. Higgins. Next slide. So Dr. Higgins, what is lung cancer and what are the different types of lung cancer? Sure. So that's a, that's a, a great question and I think one that um, is often hard to wrestle with when you're looking at information online. So it's important that you that you go to, to good sources um, that Dr. Mata has pointed out, like RT answers. Um, but if you think about cancer in general, what it is, is a uncontrolled cell growth. And so lung cancer is when cells, whether they're in the lung or cells that line the airways, start to grow uncontrollably. And that forms a tumor. That can also be referred to as a mass, and a large lymph node, a nodule. Um, when the, the tumor is biopsied and shows a diagnosis of cancer, it's then referred to as, as a lung cancer. And there are different types of lung cancer, and that's the, the first step that um, will happen after you get a biopsy is that the pathologist will look at the, the tumor sample under a microscope to distinguish what type of lung cancer you have because that will drive the treatment that is recommended. And so um, there are two broad categories of lung cancer, um, non-small cell lung cancer and small cell lung cancer. Non-small cell lung cancer um, comprises 85% of all lung cancers. So it's definitely the most common type of lung cancer. And within non-small cell lung cancer, there are um, really two distinct types, adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. And um, typically adenocarcinomas can arise in um, more frequently in non-smokers, um, in, in younger patients. Um, the cancer actually arises from cells that produce mucus um, and, and they have a distinct look under a microscope when your pathologist is, is assigning the diagnosis of adenocarcinoma. Now, squamous cell carcinoma is um, a type of cancer that arrives, arises typically from the cells that line your, your airways. And these tumors tend to be more common in um, people that have had history of smoking. They tend to be located more centrally um, in the airways. Um, and um, they tend to um, potentially not have as many um, targetable mutations compared with adenocarcinomas. And then switching to the other category of lung cancers, there is small cell cancer. And that, again, is, is more rare, only about 
of all lung cancers, but it arises from um, neuroendocrine cells, and those are, are cells, nerve cells or hormone secreting cells um, that typically will line your airways, and they tend to be located also more kind of in the middle of your chest um, in the lymph node regions. Um, and again, it's really critical for your cancer to be subtyped into a specific type of lung cancer because that will guide the next steps in your treatment. Okay, and um, Dr. Jabor, why do people um, why do people get lung cancer, and uh, do you have to smoke to get lung cancer? So the main reason patients can experience lung cancer is related to smoking and inhalation of tobacco smoke. Um, this contains many carcinogens and can um, obviously live within the lung to then create mutations um, in the cells of the lung and lead to lung cancers. In addition, um, people who are non-smokers that live with smokers can have secondhand smoke exposure, and this can, of course, uh, also predispose non-smokers who live with smokers to have um, be at risk for lung cancer. There are also other causes, such as COPD, a family history of lung cancer, prior infections, asbestos exposure, nickel exposure, um, diesel fuel exposure. There are many kinds of exposures, including air pollution has been found to contribute to the risk of lung cancer. So in addition to smoking, we know there are many exposures um, that, pe that people can experience, um, even you know, um, fumes from cooking, from um, charcoal, et cetera, um, can predispose patients to experience lung cancer. So in sum, um, in addition to exposures, again, there are family history, um, family histories of lung cancer, infections, and other things that can lead patients to have lung cancer. And in non-smokers, um, what are the causes for lung cancer? We, we really don't know why non-smokers get lung cancer. Again, secondhand exposure to, to smoke. Um, we also know there are genetic mutations that can often drive lung cancer in younger patients, particularly women. Um, and th these may be other reasons uh, for people who are non-smokers to get cancer in addition to, like I mentioned earlier, exposures and pollution, et cetera. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Robinson, is there any way to prevent getting lung cancer if you do smoke? That's a great question. Overall, even though we know some patients uh, who don't smoke can get lung cancer, uh, since the majority of patients who get it do smoke, the most powerful way to prevent it is to quit. Uh, smoking cessation is overwhelmingly the most powerful tool if you do smoke. And the results are impressive. If you quit, you get almost half the risk of lung cancer within just a few years after quitting. Um, there are other less common but established things. So radon exposure, for example, is one. Um, this is something you'll hear about when you buy your new or old house, but ultimately it's actually the second most common cause of lung cancer. And it's something that can be mitigated if you find it. So that's something to keep an eye out for as well. But I think importantly, uh, beyond that, there have never been any vitamin supplements or other special diets that have been convincingly shown to reduce lung cancer. Uh, smoking cessation is the most powerful tool. Um, supplements and vitamins don't, haven't been shown to help. And in fact, actually in some studies such as high doses of beta carotene, uh, the risk might actually be higher. So um, talk to your physician before embarking on any type of a uh, uh, high dose diet with other vitamins or supplements. All right, thank you. And uh, Dr. Urbanik, who is a candidate for lung cancer screening and, and how does the screening work? Yeah, so lung cancer screening is one of those nice victories in uh, the constant fight uh, to try and do better in the treatment of lung cancer and prevention, I guess, of later stage disease. Um, so earlier studies uh, with uh, CT scans um, showed that there was survival benefit by detecting lung cancer early. Um, and it kind of makes sense, you know, large lung cancers are hard to treat. Early lung cancers have uh, treatments where we can have a high likelihood of uh, beating lung cancer. So the next question is really, who do you screen? And so, you know, if you think about it broad strokes, so why not screen everyone? And the problem with screening everyone is they don't have a high enough chance of us actually finding something that it makes the risks of the scan worthwhile or 
um, makes the public health cost of the scan worthwhile. So we have to narrow it down a bit to populations where we think there's a high enough chance that we'll actually find something. And so um, it kind of makes sense with uh, what causes lung cancer, predominantly smoking, uh, but also radon exposure. Exposures really that take uh, uh, over a course of years to occur and for accumulation of the damage to occur. And so we want to uh, screen people who are 55 and older up to an age of about 77. Hard to know if screening as we get older than that is really going to still have the same benefit and, and outcome. Um, and then patients who either are continuing to smoke or have quit in the last 15 years and were reasonably um, substantial smokers. Like in my own life, you know, I had smoked recreation, recreationally back in my college days and shortly after um, prior to becoming a doctor. Um, but I never had, you know, a high uh, pack year number of uh, years that I actually smoked for. But these are people who smoked for, you know, one pack a day for 30 years or two packs a day for 15 years or I guess feasibly half a pack a day for 60 years. I guess the math would, would work for that. Um, but have a, a, a real uh, substantial exposure to the carcinogen. And uh, studies have shown that if we find it early, we can... Uh, pick up enough of those and uh, increase the uh, cure uh, chance, which is fantastic. All right, thank you. And um, Dr. Higgins, how important is screening for lung cancer in your opinion? And is it better to screen for it than to just wait for symptoms to develop naturally? So I think lung cancer screening is very important, but I think it's underutilized um, in the United States. Um, as Dr. Arbanic mentioned, there have been studies that have shown that if you, you get this CT scan once a year, it reduces your chance of dying of lung cancer. Um, but unfortunately, many patients who are high risk aren't offered lung cancer screening from their primary care doctor. So I urge you, if you have a loved one that has a heavy smoking history or is an active smoker, to really ask them to ask their primary care doctor if they qualify for lung cancer screening. I, I think it's um, really going to be one of the key strategies to increasing the survival rates of lung cancer is, is to really double down on lung cancer screening because ultimately what that does is it will allow us to diagnose lung cancer at an earlier stage of disease. So if you see the, the picture on the slide that was shown, it shows how a cancer can progress from a very small nodule to a bigger tumor to a, a tumor that involves all of the vascular structures around it. And um, with each stepwise growth of the tumor, your likelihood of, of being cured goes down. But if we can diagnose these cancers um, at stage one, you know, we have a greater than 50% chance of, of curing you. Even stage two or stage three, we're getting better and better at curing those patients of their lung cancer. And, and we want to be able to sit down with our patients and say, our goal is to cure you. Um, and, and that is all hinging on diagnosing lung cancer at an earlier stage. What we don't want is um, to see more patients diagnosed with metastatic stage four lung cancer. And I, I worry about that with the COVID-19 pandemic and, and whatnot. I think lung cancer screening, again, is the key to improving survival for lung cancer patients. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Jabor, uh, what types of tests are done once a patient is diagnosed with lung cancer? And why are these tests important for staging a cancer? And, and why does the stage even matter? Well, once um, somebody is diagnosed with lung cancer, perhaps by a screening CT, uh, they may meet with their doctor to uh, first have a full history and physical exam and blood work. Um, they may then undergo a more detailed CT scan that might include um, their abdomen, as well as their chest with um, contrast or IV dye. They may also undergo a PET scan um, to better understand if there's been spread of cancer to other parts of the body, as well as a brain MRI. Um, in addition to all of these kinds of tests or CAT scans that are imaging tests that are being done, uh, a biopsy would be required to make the diagnosis of lung cancer. And a biopsy is when a sample of tissue is obtained by a needle most often or by surgery to know what kind of cancer is being, um, being evaluated, you know, um, what kind of cancer is being seen on the scans and correlating that to, um, to what the biopsy shows. So for example, as Dr. Higgins explained earlier, 
Uh, there are many types of lung cancer and a biopsy is important to determine what kind of lung cancer is being um, dealt with. And um, the biopsies can be done by a needle through the chest wall. Um, that's called a percutaneous biopsy or transthoracic biopsy. Uh, a biopsy could also be performed uh, with a video camera down the airway called a bronchoscopic biopsy or endoscopic, um, basically an endoscopic biopsy similar to a colonoscopy, but down the airway. And, um, and also surgery, uh, different types of surgical procedures could be performed to make the diagnosis of lung cancer. For example, a mediastinoscopy also would pass a small camera into the lung to take biopsies of lymph nodes or perhaps a tumor. And um, all of these tests culminate in the ability of us, of the physician, to be able to help the patient to come up with a stage of lung cancer. And the stage is very important because it guides and determines how the patient would be treated. And so really uh, what we're trying to come up with with these different tests and information is to really determine how best to help the patient um, be treated for, for their cancer. Great, thank you. So, um, so now, you know, I just wanted to tell the audience again, if you have any questions, please, uh, you know, type them in any time and we'll, we'll answer them throughout the presentation. Um, are there any additional discussion points that anyone on our panel has about the diagnosis of lung cancer before we move on to treatment? Okay, sounds good. So, uh, so we can go to the next slide. So uh, the next section is on uh, curative treatment of non-small cell lung cancer. So next slide. So uh, Dr. Robinson, uh, which types of doctors are involved with patients with non-small cell lung cancer and, and which types of treatment does each of them offer? Yeah, thank you. There are a lot of different physicians that ultimately end up taking care of you when you're diagnosed with lung cancer. There's three main type, types of doctors that manage uh, these patients. They tend to be the medical oncologists, the surgeons, and the radiation oncologists. The medical oncologists are the ones that we typically think of as giving things like chemotherapy or other systemic drugs. Sometimes they can give, be given orally now. Some of these agents are um, traditional chemotherapy, and some of them are more uh, based on things like immunotherapy. So there's a wide variety of drugs. These are typically given by the medical oncologists. The surgeons are the ones that we think of, typically thoracic surgeons, uh, trained specifically to remove tumors in the chest. Uh, and um, then there's radiation oncologists, which is the group that we have here today. And uh, we tend to manage patients in all phases of their treatment, from the earliest stages of cancer to the later stages for tumors that can be cured with just a few simple sessions to ones that require more intensive therapy. Um, and for tumors that maybe are causing symptoms, pain, bleeding, or otherwise, where radiation can really have a significant improvement in those effects. We tend to work together as a team. We work in what we call a multidisciplinary man manner, which is where we all get together and discuss these cases. It is also worth noting though, that while these are the three main doctors you might work with, there's a whole team behind the scenes that works as well. Uh, and we work with your pulmonologist if you have one to help with the breathing issues and they may often be the ones to biopsy the tumor. Uh, radiologists who interpret the x-rays, PET scans, CTs, MRIs, et cetera, may also help with biopsies. Some of those radiologists can even sometimes freeze or burn the tumor when it's required. And then of course the pathologists, which are increasingly one of the most important members of the team that can help determine what kind of cancer you have and more importantly, what types of drugs it might respond to. Right, very good. And, and Dr. Urbanik, um, can you tell us a little bit about the different types of surgical procedures that may be offered to a patient with lung cancer? Um, you know, also a lot of patients may have heard about robotic surgery. Is that any better than the standard surgical procedures for lung cancer? Yeah, sure. Um, so surgery is, you know, a key component of uh, lung cancer treatment, as uh, Dr. Robinson was talking about. Um, the surgeons really are... Uh, involved in the treatment of lung cancer through the early stages of disease. So stage one disease through stage three disease. And what that means is for patients that either have um, a single tumor in the lung 
uh, or perhaps up to and including um, a small number of lymph nodes in the middle of the chest. I, I leave it kind of loose because um, a lot of different surgeons, even at very famous institutions, are going to have very different criteria and opinions about where they draw the line on which patients are ultimately good for an operation or not. Um, but in general, the one uh, key piece is that all those patients need to be healthy enough to undergo the surgery that's being offered. And so that's going to be the limitation, right? Can a patient have on the extreme end of the spectrum, have an entire half of the lung removed, meaning one uh, side completely taken out, that would be the sort of the most involved surgery. That's not done very often anymore. Uh, or can they have just a lobe of the lung and there are three lobes on the right and two uh, lobes on the left? Or, or can they just have a piece of the lung taken out? And what are the other health problems that may contribute to the risk of having that spectrum of procedures? That's going to be the biggest determination, right? So, you know, you have a young patient in their early 50s with a small peripheral lung cancer, and I think all of us would probably agree that surgical resection is going to be the mainstay of treatment. As you start talking to radiation doctors and we start getting into patients who are on the older end of the spectrum, again, leave that a little bit loose, um, with a broader range of uh, health problems, um, then the risks of surgery are going to start to ratchet up and maybe not outweigh some non-operative treatments. Um, the question you had about robotic surgery is a good one. And the first thing I, I would generally caution patients on is making sure that they're seeing a surgeon who's experienced in lung cancer, right? Um, there are multiple studies done across multiple different types of cancers that show that uh, medical centers that are relatively high volume and whatever treatment they're doing are going to have better outcomes, that surgeons are going to have better outcomes if they do a lot of something. And you don't want to be seeing the person who does one or two of these operations a year. You wanna see the person who's doing this over and over, not only because the surgeon has a skill, but the entire care team in the hospital is really gonna understand what's going on. Um, and then the next layer to that is what type of surgery to have. Well, classically sort of suggest on the, on the upper picture there is this big open operation, you know, where they, they you know, slice open a big wound on the side of someone, spread the ribs and really go in there and, and, and have a wide view and take things out. We've now been able to progress surgery to the point where they can use very small incisions, either with cameras uh, and tools that are still manipulated by your hands, or now with robotic surgery, where you can use tools that are manipulated remotely. And the advantage of that is really twofold, is the surgeon's gonna have more visualization of what they're trying to look at, they have, so the cameras can get in there better and tighter and the tools are gonna to have more uh, wrist action, meaning they're gonna have more ability to manipulate what the surgeon wants to do rather than the straight laparoscopic tools. And so, you know, the data um, is suggestive. Um, you know, I wouldn't say it slams the door on other operative procedures, but the data is pretty suggestive that robotic surgery um, is gonna reduce the, the problems in the short term um, that patients have from an operation um, and I would add to that, seeing a surgeon who does a lot of the procedure is really going to help add to those outcomes as well. All right, thank you. And um, Dr. Higgins, if you could just build on Dr. what Dr. Urbanik just said, um, why might a patient not want surgery to treat their non-small cell lung cancer? What are the types of risks that uh, patients might have with surgery? And, and why are some patients not candidates for surgery at all? Sure. So... First, I want to give the disclaimer that really the surgeon should be the, the doctor that um, decides if a patient is a candidate for a surgery um, because they will understand the risk factors for the patient the best given that's their specialty. Um, but some patients don't want surgery. Um, maybe it's because um, you know, they fear anesthesia or the potential um, hospitalization period or complications that could transpire after the surgery. Um, there are real reasons why a patient would not be a surgical candidate, and that is typically related to lung function. Um, many times a patient may have had a prior lung cancer and they had part of the lung removed and now they have a new lung cancer and they really wouldn't tolerate more lung being removed or they would have to go on home oxygen, for example. And, and most people would do, um, would avoid a surgery if they, if they could, um, if it meant that they would have to go on home oxygen. I think that's a critical point. Um, but there are even some 
I have some patients, for example, who've had a stroke and have decreased mobility. And if they were to undergo surgery, they would have a higher risk of postoperative lung infection because they're not very mobile. Um, and some patients that have really bad heart disease, for example, or um, have to be on blood thinners and really can't afford to go off those blood thinners for a big surgery. Um, so those are some of the, the main reasons why we, we see patients who are not surgical candidates. Sounds good. And now getting into radiation a little more, uh, Dr. Jabor, how does radiation work? So radiation works and um, by you can actually see these uh, nice pictures here on the screen that help you to understand how it works. Um, so radiation is delivered through um, basically a very strong x-ray machine that can be directed towards the tumor and precisely at that. Um, it's, it's very focused and uh, very concentrated on where we need to deliver the radiation. And the radiation uh, really penetrates to the tumor itself and causes these small breaks in the DNA of the tumor that is inside the tumor cell. And so um, with repeated injury to the DNA, the cell really cannot grow and cannot divide. And, um, and this uh, kind of long course of radiation or short courses of radiation injure the DNA um, really leading to cell death. And uh, that is the effect that we want to achieve from radiation to allow for tumors to uh, be cured or shrink or have reduction of symptoms from the cancer. And um, it is quite effective at doing this. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Robinson, what are some of the different types of radiation therapy that may be offered to patients with non-small cell lung cancer? Thanks. There are a, a number of different ways to deliver radiation. Generally, we tend to classify them in terms of the dose we give per day and the number of treatments we give and um, oftentimes how we deliver it. Uh, generally speaking, you'll find that patients often are treated either with what we call fractionated radiation, which is giving lower doses per day over several weeks. This is often used in situations where the tumor is larger or more extensive, and particularly if we're combining it with chemotherapy so that we can strike that perfect balance between killing the tumor but trying to save some of the healthy tissues as well. Um, increasingly, you'll find that we're using larger doses per day over fewer treatments, which we'll call stereotactic radiation or SBRT or SABR. This is typically given to smaller tumors, such as the ones that a surgeon might remove in the earliest stages and is a a uh, viable alternative to surgery, particularly for patients that can't tolerate a surgery or at high risk for surgery. Um, but we're also increasingly using it in patients who have cancer that's already spread um, to other parts of the body or other parts of the chest and metastatic disease. Uh, and uh, increasingly, we're finding that in patients who have smaller number of spots, that these precision high-dose focus treatments um, can really control their disease for uh, quite a bit longer than um, chemotherapy alone. And ultimately, these treatments can be delivered with a variety of different techniques. Uh, it's hard to not get confused by the, uh, the terminology all over the internet and the different types of treatments. Um, you'll th see things like 3D radiation or IMRT. These are just ways of getting the radiation uh, prescription uh, to focus in on the lesion in the, in the body and, and how to deliver the treatment. Um, most patients receive x-rays as the way to get treated, also known as uh, photons. Increasingly, you'll see a reference to a type of radiation called protons, which is just another way of delivering radiation. It's a different type of particle. They have their pros and cons. None of these are so well worked out that you should get too concerned uh, which one of these techniques you receive or how you receive it. And it's just important to speak with your doctor about the pros and cons of all those approaches. All right, thank you. And Dr. Urbanik, um, for patients getting SBRT, what types of side effects are common with it? And what do radiation oncologists do to reduce the risk of those side effects? Yeah, so, you know, when we're talking about SBRT, we're talking specifically about high dose radiation to a relatively small target. Um, and oftentimes, although it, the field's changing a bit, to things that are not in the middle of the chest. So when I think about radiation in general, I, I, I think that my job is to kill the cancer, right? So really, if you boil that down, is to aim at something and injure it, right? And so the risks of SBRT are all about what's nearby that could be injure, injured with treatment. 
Um, and for most patients with SBRT, they're going to have very limited side effects. And, and there's going to be a proportion of patients that really don't have any side effects. Um, but of patients who do get side effects, the most common one is some tiredness. Uh, the second most common one could be uh, changes related to their uh, lung function, oftentimes subtle, maybe a little increase in their cough, uh, maybe some temporary short-windedness. Um, there's going to be a, a subset of those patients that progress along and have, you know, enough change in their uh, get up and go or exercise tolerance. They're going to notice a change in their activity level because of treatment. Um, but again, in these patients, oftentimes we're making the decision to do this treatment because they're not going to have surgical resection. And so our view would be that the, the risk of these side effects is actually going to be less than the risk of having an operation. And then the other side effects are, are probably a little less common. You know, the risks of having swallowing trouble or swallowing changes. Um, for SBRT, the risks of having heart injury in general are pretty, pretty darn low, although not zero. A lot of this depends on the location of the tumor. Um, the risk of having nowadays any skin reaction from treatment, again, is pretty low. Um, you know, about one in 10 patients can have soreness in their rib cage or their chest wall if the tumor's near it. Um, and that can occur somewhere in the order of six to nine months after treatment because of the little bit of scarring that we cause. Um, on the pictures on the screen there, the, the picture on the bottom right, um, you know, is probably one to think about. That was probably a tumor that was fairly central to the middle of the chest and there's been some injury to some of the larger airways patient like that might have, you know, more breathing trouble uh, than the vast majority of patients, but those are the kinds of patients that we're always very careful about. And when we consent people or ask their permission to do the treatment, we talk through all of these different uh, risks just to make sure that people are aware of what's most likely to happen versus what's uh, rarely going to happen in treatment. Thank you. And, and Dr. Higgins, um, for patients getting a longer course of intensity modulated radiation therapy, how are the side effects any different and, and what do radiation oncologists do to try to reduce those side effects? So first, I, I want to emphasize that the side effects of longer courses of radiation um, for lung cancer, typically for stage three lung cancer, have really gotten better over time. And that's primarily due to improvements in the radiation technology, the technology that we use to deliver the treatment to your tumor. Um, nowadays, um, the risk of, for example, getting inflammation in your lung after a six week course of radiation is only about 10% or so. And it used to be um, 20 years ago, about 25%. So our technologies have improved over time and that's really driving down the likelihood that our patients will develop side effects. Um, that being said, the main ones we see for the longer courses, again, would be fatigue. Um, you could also see that inflammation of the esophagus, which typically manifests with like a heartburn type feeling in your chest or some difficulty with swallowing. That's transient. It goes away. It typically um, will go away about, you know, 10 to 12 days after completion of radiation. Um, and, and those are really, I think, the main side effects. And and one of the main things that radiation oncologists will do to mitigate the risk of side effects is we'll try to make our, our radiation volumes as, as small as they can be. We don't give radiation anymore to um, lymph nodes that don't have cancer, and um, we used to do that just to try to reduce um, the risk of cancer spreading to those areas. And, and we've really um, honed down on, on creating small radiation treatment volumes to reduce the side effects for our patients. Okay, thanks. So with all this in mind, Dr. Jabor, um, is there clear evidence that surgery or radiation is more likely to cure a patient with non-small cell lung cancer in different situations? Well, I think it's a complicated, um, this is a complicated question um, that comes down a little bit to patient preference, patient's overall health, and stage of cancer. So for a stage one lung cancer, which are stage one or perhaps an early stage two lung cancer, where we, um, we really don't have studies that compare surgery to radiation head to head. We don't have those randomized trials that give us this information to truly determine which study, which option is better 
surgery or radiation. And so uh, we, we don't know the absolute answer to this, but we can kind of estimate from studies that have um, tried to show um, how the results compare. And for stage one lung cancer, um, although we may be looking at slightly different patient populations, meaning patients of varied health, um, perhaps patients who are um, less, um, less likely to have surgery, um, who go on to get radiation, for example, patients with heart disease, patients who feel too weak to get surgery. Uh, when we look at the results of um, surgery versus radiation for early stage lung cancer in these kinds of patients, we feel that the results may be very similar. Um, we don't, um, we, again, we don't have head-to-head -head comparisons, but it's likely um, that the results could be comparable for early stage lung cancers um, in patients who are not surgical candidates. Um, as far as later stages of lung cancer, such as stage three lung cancer, where um, it might be difficult to fully remove all the cancer due to lymph node spread um, using surgery, we, we really don't know what um, the outcomes are in head-to-head -head comparisons with radiation alone versus surgery alone. Um, it's possible that surgery may extend um, the period in which the cancer, um, the patient is cancer-free, but whether or not that makes the patient live longer, it's hard to know. Um, so really we don't have head-to-head -head comparisons of um, radiation versus surgery in a lot of these stages. Um, again, it may come down to patient health or preference or location of lymph nodes and volume of lymph nodes in uh, the more locally advanced setting. This is really a question that um, you would want to discuss with your multidisciplinary team, your medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, and surgical oncologist to make sure that you've made the best decision for your care. Thank you. So, um, so Dr. Robinson, do you think all patients, or, or should all patients with non-small non cell lung cancer see a radiation oncologist to discuss radiation therapy as a treatment option? That's a good question. Um, ultimately, while not all patients are likely to benefit equally from all the three main ways to treat lung cancer, as we discussed with systemic therapy, surgery, or radiation, um, and it's not always important to meet all the members of the team in person, it is, it is important that each of those treatments be considered for your cancer, ideally through either a formal, what we call tumor board or tumor conference uh, or informal discussions with your physicians. Um, and so in an in a ideal situation in your cancer center, radiation would always be considered as part of the, the treatment options. And there should be a low threshold to have you seen in the clinic to discuss these. Even if it turns out that it's not right today, it may be right in the future. Um, one circumstance that I think is important to really keep in mind, though, is things like stereotactic radiation for early stage lung cancer, uh, where it may not always be discussed routinely given the um, capabilities of your cancer center. And so discussing that with your doctors and making sure that you're aware of that as an option, particularly if you're at a higher risk for surgery, uh, is important and may sometimes require you to seek out opinions elsewhere and, and, uh, and, and follow the ability to get that treatment somewhere else. Uh, but overall, though, I think it's important that this be uh, an important modality that's considered along with the other treatments. All right, very good. So, um, Dr. Abanek, we got a question from the audience, which um, I'm going to ask you in, in relation to the next set of questions, too. So, uh, the question from the audience is, are there any new studies in radiation that have made a difference in how lung cancer is treated now or will be treated in the future? Um, and you can think about this in the context of, you know, maybe chemotherapy, immunotherapy, other targeted therapies alongside surgery or radiation and how each of these work. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a, that's a fantastic question. And I think it ties into this slide uh, very nicely. So, um, and it kind of ties into a bit of what uh, the, Dr. Robinson and Jabour were talking about just a minute ago is, Lung cancer is a team sport, um, and you have to have um, your different specialists really working together and having a collegial relationship where they can talk about the pros and cons of what they need to do. Um, in terms of recent studies, um, the one that I think is most prominent in our field and probably the single most important study, I, I would say humbly in the past you know, six or seven years is the study where we added immunotherapy uh, to the treatment of stage three lung cancer. That's shown in the, the slide at the bottom there, where um, this is a slide of what we call progression-free survival, meaning how, how often did the cancer 
uh, continue to go on and grow after treatment was done either in the same location or another location. Um, but what that slide is showing there is with the addition of immunotherapy and a specific medicine here called Duralumab, that many, many more patients went on to not have their tumor uh, recur um, in the future. Um, and that has held up durably now over a long period of time. And, you know, it's probably been the single most important advance in the treatment of lung cancer in my career um, is the addition of immunotherapy. Um, there are other studies, I think, recently um, as well, which show where we can peel back therapy, right? So it's not always adding in more. Sometimes it's really trying to, to moderate what we do. And the reason we moderate what we do is because the side effects of the treatments that we give are real and we can hurt people if they don't need to be treated and they're treated. And so there was a recent study, I think, which is going to change some of what we do in our field where less patients after surgery are going to need radiation. We used to be much more uh, liberal in the number of patients that would get uh, radiation after they had their tumor taken out, particularly if they had lymph nodes in the middle of their chest. And now I think the, the, um, the number of patients that are going to be treated is going to be much more limited to patients that may have had some residual cancer obviously left behind based on positive margins, or we can do a scan and we see cancer that's still there, those sort of indications. So I think those are two examples. One where we add a treatment, and it's been a, 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 you know, a major change in our field, although not a perfect one. And another one where we've been able to pull back treatment, and particularly what we do on this call, um, radiation. And I think both are, are great examples of how the field continues to move forward. And interestingly, I think amongst the, um, the docs here on the call, we're all involved in these large national uh, treatment uh, teams, uh, whether they're the NRG or the Alliance or ECOG or SWOG that are really working hard across institutions to come up with advances in lung cancer and really try and, uh, you know, change um, the future. Um, because it breaks my heart when I lose patients. Um, and, uh, you know, if I can contribute in a little way to that process, it, uh, it really makes, uh, makes my whole career worthwhile. All right, thank you. And um, Dr. Higgins, here's another, um, another question from the audience. So how often should I get a CT scan after I've gotten radiation therapy? Um, and tied in with the next question on the slides too, if lung cancer does recur on one of those CT scans, is it possible to try to cure it again with more radiation therapy? Yeah, so that's a good question. Typically, you're going to need CT scans more frequently uh, right after you finish your radiation for your lung cancer. Um, if your radiation was given to a tumor in your chest and lymph nodes, we would typically do a CT scan um, every three to six months for the first several years. Um, eventually, we can move to once a year, once it's been several years without any um, cancer recurring. Um, but we need to keep a close eye on, on that tumor, especially during the early phases after you completed radiation. Um, and the reason that that's important is because we need to pick up if the tumor starts to grow again. And, and that can happen. Um, if it does happen, usually it's important to try to, to biopsy it because sometimes after you give radiation, you can cause a scar in the region where the radiation was given and it can look a little confusing on your CT scan. And you know, if you had a CT scan, let's say at a facility outside where you got your cancer treatment and they didn't have the prior image, they may say that the cancer looks like it's back when in fact it's just a scar. So that's just something to sort of keep in mind when you're undergoing these surveillance CT scans. Um, but if, if we do pick up that the cancer is growing and we, we prove it with a biopsy, um, radiation can at times be given again. It typically depends on the time interval since the first course of radiation. If it's been um, a much longer period of time, let's say it's a new type of lung cancer and it's been over five years, then we can safely give more radiation. At my institution, we have um, protons, so we're trying to do that with proton therapy um, because we can reduce the, the total dose that your organs sees, like your spinal cord and your esophagus and your heart. So I would say, to sum that up, in limited cases, you can get radiation twice, but we have to be very judicious in making that determination because we don't want to cause um, unnecessary side effects. So it really depends on your exact tumor, how long it's been since you had that prior radiation, and what technologies your radiation oncologist has available to consider retreatment with. All right, thank you. And uh, Dr. Jabor, another question from the audience. Um, 
will I lose my hair if I get radiation? Am I at risk for another cancer if I get radiation? And you know, maybe along with answering those, you could answer, uh, you know, what are some other important things patients should do to take care of themselves after a curative treatment of non-small cell lung cancer? Great, what great questions. Um, so thank you for those. So uh, will, will you lose your hair? So in general, the radiation for lung cancer will not cause hair loss on the head. Um, obviously, if there is hair on the thorax, uh, that may diminish, but um, hair on the head um, would not be affected by uh, radiation therapy to the chest. Um, as far as um, will radiation cause a second cancer, um, that's a really good question. In general, uh, radiation can cause second cancers. Uh, we estimate the risk to be very low and um, the benefit of radiation therapy, especially in situations where we're curing patients to be much greater. And so with um, kind of that balance of you know, benefit versus risk, we accept that there's a very tiny risk um, in the very single digits um, over years of patients potentially um, having a second cancer from radiation or medicine therapy, such as chemotherapy. Um, again, in the effort to really appropriately treat patients, we accept those risks because they're very small. And um, how to take care of yourself after a curative treatment for lung cancer? Well, I think uh, number one, you can see some of the, um, the nice pictures here to quit smoking. Um, obviously, if we can um, really keep um, patients from smoking after treating them for lung, from lung cancer, this can decrease the risk of other lung cancers forming. Um, as Dr. Robinson mentioned earlier. Also, um, we would recommend a regimen of exercise, um, obviously for a lot of reasons for improving um, any fatigue or tiredness that may result from treatment exercises, well proven through uh, hundreds of studies to really reduce uh, fatigue. Also, it can reduce stress and improve energy. And also um, eating a well-balanced diet, uh, drinking plenty of water, um, and reducing kind of any sort of other substances um, that are non-essential, um, doing them in moderation, even alcohol in moderation can help prevent other cancers from forming. So uh, in general, um, really trying to kind of keep a healthy lifestyle, including exercise, diet, um, and avoiding tobacco. Thank you. All right, great. So um, a few more questions from the audience. Uh, Dr. Robinson, uh, someone was asking about COVID and how that is impacting treatments in terms of delays or even not doing treatment. No, it's a legitimate concern. Um, I think as we all open up our phones and look at the news and, and see this recent surge, it's something that's on all of our minds. Um, early on when we were still learning a lot more about how infectious COVID was and how it was transmitted, there was a lot of concern about getting patients into the hospital to get diagnosed for their cancer and then treated for their cancer. Um, uh, remarkably, the diagnosis issue still seems to be a problem. Um, the, uh, there seems to be an increased fear about coming in to get uh, diagnosed for uh, symptoms that may be referable to your lung cancer. There have been a number of papers that have shown that people seem to be getting diagnosed at later stages in their illness. Um, which is uh, really frightening given that it is so much more difficult to treat when the cancers become more advanced. But despite that, what's important to realize is that uh, even with uh, COVID in the, in the region and even for patients who even have COVID, it doesn't mean you can't be treated for your cancer. Um, many of our clinics now have come up with methods for managing this. Uh, so for example, at our own clinic, patients who are doing well enough but are positive with COVID can still come in and get their treatment after hours and we have a cleaning process that allows us to then assure that other patients are safe as well. So you shouldn't have a, a concern that um, there's no way to get this managed and you know certainly please if there's any symptoms that you're concerned about um, get those checked out early because we can still treat these patients and get them treated well. All right, thank you. Um, and Dr. Urbanik, another question from the audience. Uh, it says, I'm a non-smoker recently diagnosed with lung cancer. I've heard of biomarker testing. Should I do that to determine how and why I got the cancer? So that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, and I'm sorry you've had to have this uh, diagnosis. Um, you know, that's not an easy thing to have to live with. Um, 
So there are a couple of reasons why you would want to get um, biomarker testing, molecular testing. Um, and, and I think it's not so much to find out why you got the cancer, because I don't know that it'll answer that uh, per se. Um, you know, maybe there's a family history and, you know, in rare situations, somebody might have a genetic reason, but that's, that's pretty unusual. What molecular testing really can do is help your physician determine what treatment is best for you. Whether or not, if you have um, an adenocarcinoma, is there going to be a targeted therapy? So, for example, enerlotinib or osimertinib, um, which are EGFR medications, or a medication like crizotinib or one of the newer versions of that medications that are targeted at the ALK mutation. That's really going to help your doctor try and figure out what best, what way to treat you best for your cancer. Um, and additionally, there are also tests that can determine whether or not, you know, immuno, is immunotherapy going to be right for you or not? Um, so I think those are all important. I, I don't know that they're going to unfortunately tell you why you got the cancer. That's going to be, that's one of those tough, tough questions that doesn't always have an easy answer to live with, for sure. All right, thank you. Um, so now we'll move on to the next section, uh, which is on palliative treatment of non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, so the first question is for Dr. Robinson. So, uh, so what types of medical or systemic treatments are usually offered to patients when their lung cancer is stage four? And how often do these treatments get rid of a cancer completely? Thanks. That's a great question and fortunately an increasingly more difficult one to answer in 2020. Uh, years ago, the answer would have been chemotherapy. That's it. But fortunately, there's been an explosion in therapy since that time. So the main three things that people will get uh, for their uh, stage four lung cancer will either be standard chemotherapy, which are drugs that essentially attack dividing cells such as cancer cells. And there's a variety of different drugs that are given typically through the veins, given weekly, every three weeks, every four weeks or so on, depending on the types of drugs. Those are what most people are most familiar with if they've had a friend or family member undergo treatment in the last 10 to 20 years. Increasingly, uh, whenever possible, we try to use treatments that are more targeted to the patient's cancer. And so that uh, reflects what Dr. Banik was just mentioning, which is getting the tumor tested and looking at, at its molecular profile. Um, so in certain circumstances, unfortunately, still the minority of cases, uh, we will find uh, specific mutations that make the tumor very sensitive to oral drugs, such as the ones that uh, he just mentioned right now. The nice thing about that is that if you find that mutation, those tumors tend to be quite sensitive and, and can respond to those drugs uh, for sometimes many months or years, depending, um, and newer agents are being developed all the time. And the last big improvement has been in a new class of medications called immunotherapy drugs, which essentially take the brakes off of your immune system and allow it to attack the cancer in a more effective way. There's also markers we develop now that would indicate whether you're likely to respond to that treatment or not. So the, the cocktail of options has increased. Uh, and I think even more importantly, uh, what we've noticed is that patients seem to be doing better in general, living longer. The survival rates are improving. Uh, the survival rates free of severe symptoms from the therapies are improving. Unfortunately, though, almost none of these drugs really has the ability to eliminate cancer once it's spread. It's really, really exceptionally uncommon to have the cancer completely eliminated. But I'd like to rescope that a little bit because as I mentioned, people are living longer with these diseases. So we're often finding that in certain patients with these combinations of drugs that we're end up, we end up treating them as if it's a chronic illness like severe heart disease or lung disease or other incurable diseases that we still treat and people live their lives um, around the cancer, not because of it. Uh, so you know, have hope if you, if you get diagnosed with this disease, uh, there are increasing options. And increasingly you'll find that while this used to just be the purview of the medical oncologist to give these systemic drugs, we're often finding that we use radiation in concert with that, as I mentioned before, as a way to enhance the effectiveness of those drugs and get more mileage out of those medications as well. Thank you. And Dr. Urbanik, along those lines, uh, what is the rationale for adding in radiation to systemic therapy for patients with stage four non-small cell lung cancer? And is radiation more likely to be offered if there are just a few metastases or many metastases? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a fantastic question. And you could give a whole two hour conversation just on that subject alone. And I think it really builds on what Dr. Robinson was just talking about is uh, we're, we're finding with new medications, 
um, and better ways to deliver the radiation that patients are both living longer and potentially having less side effects from treatment. Um, when I started my career in, in uh, oncology, you know, close to 20 years ago, we really divided patients into the curative role or are we relieving symptoms role, which is, was, would have been determined as palliative, right? And now we really have this big group in the middle where, as, as Dr. Ramos was talking about, they, they oftentimes can have their cancer for a long period of time and go through many different types of medications and trying to control it. And we can add in radiation as well. There are some early encouraging studies that show treating one or a small number of metastasis with radiation um, can help people slow down the pace of their disease. Um, and in fact, some people would say that there's studies out there that would show that you know, treating one lesion in the brain or one other lesion in a specific organ like the lung or the adrenal gland, that patients can actually be cured of, of uh, their lung cancer. Um, what we see more often are patients with a small number of metastasis. There's a big national clinical trial going on right now, which is trying to test the question in the setting of some of the modern chemotherapy and immunotherapies that we have as to whether or not radiation will truly help improve outcomes. Um, we all have a bias around that question. Um, I think many of the docs on the call have been using radiation, um, specifically stereotactic radiation, to treat these uh, tumors um, for patients and have some folks who've done very, very well. Uh, I, I, I have that bias as well. Um, but I think it'll be important that we can prove that in the future. But if somebody came to see myself and they had two or three uh, relatively modest-sized metastasis, um, and they had, you know, a reasonable flight plan to get systemic therapy that was going to be useful for them. I, I would probably be trying to either get them on that trial that we were just talking about, or um, if for, what, for one of many reasons that's not feasible, we would have a conversation about the risks and benefits of treatment. I think it would be reasonable to, to look at that seriously. Great, thank you. And, and Dr. Higgins, let's say a patient is having symptoms from a spot of metastatic cancer. Is, is radiation helpful in alleviating symptoms in that situation? Yeah. Um, yeah, and what types of symptoms is it commonly used to improve? So radiation is, is very helpful in reducing pain related to tumors, whether it's pain in the bone. Um, also, radiation can help with um, pulmonary function, especially if you have a a tumor that's pressing on the airway. Um, so those are often the times when we will use palliative radiation to control symptoms related to the cancer. And it can be very beneficial. We can get patients off of narcotics, um, which can really improve quality of life, give people more energy, um, and we can help patients breathe better um, with radiation to tumors that are compressing the airways. So those are, I think, two uh, very frequently um, used uh, indications for palliative radiation in stage four lung cancer. Thank you. And um, we only have a few minutes left, so I'll go to Dr. Jabor for this last question about the future. So, so what new advances will help enable radiation therapy to better cure lung cancer in the future? Well, I think um, the continued improvement in systemic therapies really will help us to prolong life for patients and really achieve uh, a higher risk, a higher chance of cure for, for patients at any stage of lung cancer. So although we're really fortunate to have immunotherapy drugs right now, such as pd one pdl one therapies, um, it's possible we would have new ones or additional ones that could enhance the duration of benefit for patients, allowing us to give more radiation to um, limited sites of disease, as Dr. Urbanic was mentioning. So I think that it's really, um, we really want to help patients and we can help patients when we have them live longer and we are able to offer them um, therapies to areas of symptoms or areas of limited disease, really with the goal to extend life and to provide more patients with cure. Thank you very much. Um, so I think we're out of time, but uh, thank you to all four of you. I think this was great and hopefully it was helpful for a lot of people. Thanks for thank the you. opportunity. Thank you.